Hi everyone, and um, I know it's probably good morning and possibly later in the morning for some of you, and it's nearly evening for us. But um, um, so we're based in Scotland, and uh, both Sarah and I are sort of based in the Highlands. And I'm only going to just introduce this session in the sense of, uh, particularly in relation to Sarah Paul Snyder's work, um, because it came out of um, uh, something that may be of interest to those who are participating here, where um, there has been um, an ongoing collaboration uh, for some years now with the uh, Forestry um, Commission, which is a sort of um, non-governmental body that was that is established by government, which is a strategic body that has an overview, um, a strategic overview, has an implementation um, remit as well for forestry in the UK, but there is a Scottish and a UK-wide organization as well. And they've um, had a tradition, I don't know if that's the right word, but they've always supported a number of PhDs across the UK uh, for, for many years um, in different institutions. Um, my, um, I'm not a, a, a forestry expert, however, uh, my uh, involvement in the, with the Forestry Commission has come about, or came about, uh, about eight, ten years ago, because they were interested in exploring um, sort of uh, more interdisciplinary forestry PhDs. And it really started off by an interest in making forests more accessible to uh, wider and more diverse audiences as a source of, largely as a source of recreation. And um, uh, we did recruit um, uh, and through the medium of using social sciences and the arts and we had an interdisciplinary PhD, which was very successful. Um, and they were very keen to fund other PhDs. And um, one of the issues that seems to have been a recurrent, um, it's an old problem, I don't think it's anything new, uh, which is about how on earth do they sustain forestry educational provision in the UK, because there were a number of courses being shut down at universities. And the number of, for example, in Scotland, we only have one forestry school, and that's based in the University of the Highlands Islands in my institution here. So um, I looked at the information, and it was largely uh, studies that were very much um, demand and supply driven, you know, very much looking at it from the point of view of the forest industry, as, as it were, um, in a very narrow way. And Although there was a discourse around forestry, you know, having uh, a wider function than just focusing on extraction and so on, um, it was not really um, somehow, uh, it, it was not being reflected in some of the studies that were being done because really the studies were looking at the extractive industries. Um, and I thought it would be interesting to uh, prize it away from there, as it were, as a sociologist and to and I also was aware that there were uh, different conceptualizations of what forests meant. And I know this, might, this is very different in Canada and different parts of Canada. And um, so we started off with looking at, uh, you know, this notion of forestry skills for the 21st century and what that means. And, and this is where Sarah Paul Snyder's PhD has come in. She's, uh, she's in the third year. She's uh, in the phase of writing it. Um, uh, writing a thesis for submission this year. And, you know, from that has, uh, uh, that emerged, and she'll tell you more about her PhD, from that um, emerged the collaboration with Selkirk College through the uh, Rural Policy Learning Commons and some comparative work that also took place in Oregon State University, which, or Oregon State rather, uh, hosted by Oregon State University, which won't be the subject of discussion today. So um, I suppose what I'm trying to, um, uh, without saying very much about what Sarah has been doing, our focus had, you know, very much started from a, a kind of policy issue, but also trying to bring in some much, uh, much broader thinking, drawing on disciplines. Initially, because I was a sociologist, it was linked to sociology and as well as education. 
um, that particular kind of field. But um, with Sarah coming in and she had a science background and, you know, she's um, it's, um, gone into the socio-ecological systems and, and, a, and a different sort of approach from there on. And I think one of the interesting issues for me from, uh, from sort of the outside is um, this conundrum of um, whether it's uh, nature or forests or whatever. And the, uh, as a sociologist, you know, the, uh, the constant discourse around what's useful to society or what's useful to the economy. And I, have, I find that a bit troubling. But, but Sarah will, um, will, doesn't deal with that, but it's, uh, it's one of these ongoing issues, I think. And, um, but I will leave Sarah to explain what she's been doing and to share some of the findings with you. So thank you very much. Hi everybody, this is Sarah. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'll just try and share my presentation with you guys. Just give me a second. So, okay, I think that worked. I hope so at least. Okay, so Philomena <laughs> already tried to give an overview of um, of the whole kind of project and where it came from. What I would like to focus on today is just a small portion of um, the findings that I actually had and they relate to policy impacts on forestry professionals. So in what way do certain policy frameworks and policy initiatives have an impact on um, working realities of professionals and um, into what kind of, yeah, maybe even paradigms do they put people into and in what way do they relate their own kind of role as professionals to society or whatever kind of system we see on the outside world. So um, first thing I would like to just briefly go back into um, telling a bit about the project. So the title was Mapping and Repositioning Forestry Skills for the 21st Century. Obviously that is quite a mouthful, but um, the underlying big conflict that Philomena already pointed out was that there is a disconnect between those people who are actually providing input into what should a forester actually learn for the future and um, what kind of other stakeholders are there because forests obviously expand in their roles and their new perceptions about what kind of role forests play, for example, in climate change scenarios or mitigation adaptation, all of these kinds of things. So what have I been doing? I've been conducting semi-structured in-depth interviews with in total 24, uh, 21 professionals across Great Britain, that includes Scotland, England and Wales. And um, I've been trying to find out how and why they went into forestry. How does that relate to their overall kind of concept of forestry? How do they think about their profession in general? What kind of learning needs did they come across? And um, also what kind of past and present and future issues they've seen. So obviously that, that is quite a broad study at the end of the day. Today I'll be just, I'll just be focusing on kind of policy related frameworking things that I came up with. But I don't wanna keep it too abstract. So the first thing I would like to bring closer to you is actually what do I mean with split roles in forestry? So, um, and what, I'm, what I've been doing now is actually trying to find an essence of what do people frequently refer to when I've interviewed them. So um, I've been creating a sort of archetype and I call this person Archetype Ewan. I'm going to talk about him all the time. So when I went to Archetype Ewan, who is now actually just showing what most people experienced or what I came across as being really prevalent within my interviews. So Archetype Ewan, he was asked, how did what kind of day-to-day -day job are you doing at the moment? And he came back with, okay, I am a forest manager. I'm looking mainly at producing timber. I'm trying to balance costs and benefits and I'm a project manager. So um, this archetype UN is set within the public sector. It is just an example for now, but uh, working for example in the public sector on forest management. And I, and I thought like, wow, that sounds quite, you're busy, you're an auntie. And he was like, yeah, but there's more. Actually, I'm also a collaborator. I've got to go out and engage with communities because we've got a lot of policies in place that actually encourage local communities to have a say in, in the kind of forest management that is around them. But also the local council when it comes to flood management policies and all of that, I've got to go and collaborate with them as well. 
on the other hand, he said, deer management is another big, big issue in Scotland. And um, there are a lot of other stakeholders involved from especially private sector. He's got to liaise with trying to, well, problem solve and all of these kind of issues. So he's got different kind of roles to his job. And I was pretty impressed already. And then he said, like, well, we don't stop here. We also got an educator's position because um, not only talking to the community, he's got to make sure that they understand how and why the forests are managed to ground public support at the end of the day. And he also has a kind of mentorship role for students that are coming in because they want to be professionals and they are getting a first insight into the profession. And also he would be providing, for example, training for volunteering groups. So actually, Archetype Ewan is working across a lot of different fields. And as we hear from this kind of um, split role description already, there are a lot of um, fields Ewan is involved with and a lot of kind of different power relationships. I won't be focusing on that, but just putting it out there that that might be another point that could be um, used as a lens. But um, I'm focusing on kind of policy and policy frameworks and especially the silos that, well, actually were a consequence of that. So um, let's go back to where Ewan started with. And I told you he was working in the public sector. So in Scotland now we've got that split between uh, Forest Enterprise Scotland and the Forestry Commission Scotland. It is a bit of like a checks and balances systems. On the one hand, the commission side is overseeing policy regulation and grants and all of that. And Forest Enterprise is really managing for um, economic return and all of that. So there's a split. And within Forest Enterprise, Archetype Ewan told me that uh, they've got people working in different departments, for example, harvesting, planning, planting, management, and all of these things. And he actually said, like, even within this kind of organization, which is meant to be one big organization, they're not really talking that much. So they already have this kind of notion of silos. We've got people who, are, who should be collaborating, but it's hard going. And then when we go towards the Forestry Commission side, that gets even worse. So, and that is just within the public sector. If we have a look at the private sector, which actually, um, I actually don't know if I should use, if I should move this a bit. Can I? Yes. So, um, so it's not only within the public sector that we have this kind of um, split roles. It's also within the private sector. They usually have got the same kind of managerial structures, harvesting, planting, and all of that regulation. And the third sector coming up with whatever kind of um, objective-driven mostly environmental things, or at least that was the perception. So, but these kind of sectoral things are, because we're talking about forestry and professional foresters, they're all within this kind of concept of sustainable forest management and forest management as a land use. So there are different kind of land uses which are running parallel to that actually as well. Agriculture, management for game and all of that. And that then again is put into another silo of the whole sustainability kind of framework. So we've got demands or objectives pertaining to environment, to society, to economy, within the different sectors, across different land users. And even if we talk about the kind of um, organizational culture things, even within there, we've got different silos. So if we think back about Archetype Ewan, um, we see there is so much happening for him and he's got to engage with so many different stakeholders from so many different groups and he's crossing all the sectors, all the pillars of sustainability, if you want to talk about that, and also across different land uses. So, and I think that is uh, quite a bit. But this is not even where the confusion really started. This is what Archetype Ewan would take for granted because he, he's been brought up in this kind of framework. And that is what, what he's got in mind when, when he's thinking about his profession. But actually, it's getting more confusing now because now we're getting into what kind of future things policy-wise might be coming up. Could be in relation to climate change, but other things, but I'm focusing more on um, policy aspect here. So he said, they're restructuring the public sector. There will be different roles assigned at the time of interviewing. Nobody knew what's going to happen. So that was already interesting. He was scared. He said, uncertainty. Nobody knew what's going to happen. So, and then other trends like marketization, hybridization. Nobody knows how the sectors are going to develop. There's a lot of overlap, the drive towards collaboration, having people more engage with one another and leaving these kind of sectoral silos to um, actually getting more integrated as well. 
So integration, that term is highly disputed and can be understood in so many different contexts. It could be um, when we're talking about the sectors, but also when it comes to land use in itself. So um, we could be talking about integration on a landscape scale or watersheds or ecosystems. But um, as we hear that already, the notion that we are having these discrete kind of sustainability pillars, it is just not there anymore because people or policy is taking more and more um, a push towards systems approaches, systems thinking, could be socio-ecological systems within resilience frameworks, but I don't even want to go there. It's more about the kind of notion that we are leaving these um, predefined sustainability um, trichotomy at the end of the day of environment, society and um, economy. So thinking got more and more complex. And what did that actually do? What, what, what does that mean on the ground? So. Um, I would not say it's an actual paradigm shift because obviously it's more an evolution rather than an abrupt change in something. So it evolved along the way. Paradigms fuse with one another, they dissolve, maybe they, um, they just grow. And that sometimes, because it always depends, because there's such a long history of how that um, paradigm, for example, developed. And it depends on when people come into this, what, how have they been at educated before so they they are they have certain understandings of what what does sustainability mean i mean the concept changed so much starting from the 70s up till now and it's still expanding or maybe they'll just ditch it all together but because of that there are communication barriers and um and what we've already said before forests are fulfilling new roles right now so the notion of having multiple forest trees actually not this discrete kind of land use resource management um, profession no it's actually getting more and more complex and it continues to do so so what are the impacts on adaptive capacity actually in terms of being able to respond to future challenges could be again whatever kind of challenge what challenges are about to come be it climate change pests and diseases changes within society but for a fact change is about to come so um what kind of feeling does this give to um, professionals working on the ground? And that is what I came about numerous times. It's uncertainty. It's the notion that best practice is actually contested. Nobody knows what best practice is anymore. Is it still sustainable forest management? That used to be their standard for best practice for donkey's years, but it's not anymore. And professionals are worried about that. Also, who's carrying the responsibility? Who is responsible for which kind of service provision? For example, if we talk about flood management, who is doing this in terms of forestry, obviously, or within a forestry context? And uh, with regards to restructuring the whole public sector, who's taking on leadership? What does this leadership imply for not only the public sector, but also the private sector or the third sector? Where are we going? So huge amount of um, uncertainty and yet professionals still have to work under these circumstances and then again going to switch over to the s4 archetype Ewan, um what kind of impacts did that have and it had impacts on the roles and objectives he had to perform on the job on a day-to-day -day working reality basis so the stakeholders he's got to engage with the power relationships that change dramatically when he, for example, has to go out to talk to school groups. So there, there's a big shift within that. But also, and that is the thing, um, it changed the way he sees himself as a professional. So it had an impact on his professional identity. All of those um, new concepts determine in a way how he relates to whatever is outside, be it society or whatever kind of um, framework we'd like to put in place to conceptualize that. But all of that is changing for him. And uh, to be fair, these professionals, they're so crucial for policy delivery and implementation and reaching overarching goals. So um, I think there's a real issue that we will be facing with. We, we have been facing it for a long time, but it won't get easier in the future. So therefore, my personal kind of um, implication that I would draw from, from that is um, that we need, on the one hand, to rethink what learning means for professionals, also in terms of continuous professional development, because um, those issues around uh, frameworks and how that relates to policy was usually within the interviews not identified as skills gaps at all. It was more about um, forest management and silver cultural practices and that kind of professional aspect of the job, like more the technical aspects. That was perceived as, as learning needs, but 
that is part of professionalism, but not the only part. So just putting that out there, we need to rethink that. And I think it is a discourse to be had. And on the other hand, um, and now we're coming back to what kind of stakeholders should or could be engaged for um, identifying future skills needs. And I think we need to facilitate communication between policymakers, for example, that is uh, why I'm here today, maybe, and also the professionals, because they are a tremendous resource in terms of um, finding things like this out. I mean, I've been talking to professionals and all of this came out of that. And also getting educators involved, not only in terms of um, institutions like uh, higher education institutions, but also the people who are in the field educating other peoples because they usually got a very good grip on um, what is happening in the field. So, um, yeah, I think that would be me already. <laughs> or maybe I spoke for too long, I'm so sorry. But um, yeah, well, that was my take on uh, thinking in silos and working in split roles within British forestry. So, thank you. Okay, great. Thank you both Philomena and Sarah. And we'll pass it on to Sarah Breen. So, let's see here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about, as I said, what the problem is, um, the context that I was working in, a little bit on the methods that we used, key findings, and then next steps. So this was, as Philomena mentioned, a, a connections grant with fun, that was funded through the Rural Policy Learning Commons. And so we started with a number of research questions um, and then Basically, the I won't go through and read the, the research questions, but we wanted to focus on this last, or the presentation rather, is going to focus on this last objective here, which is understanding the role of technology and innovation in the future of the forestry industry. And this is important because we know both in forestry and, and in basically every other economic industry that technology and innovation is really changing what we're doing, how we're doing it, and it's very much changing the people that are involved the types of education and training and skills and experience they need. And so this was something that we were really curious about um, be, just because of the history of forestry and, and what it's looked like and what perhaps it will look like in the future. Okay, so context, as I mentioned initially uh, on the first slide, we were looking uh, at the, the British Columbia, the Canadian context, specifically where that star is in the southeastern corner of British Columbia, that's the Kootenays where I live. And so that is, it's a mountainous region, uh, inland rainforest, lots of big trees, lots of steep slopes, uh, and a fairly large amount of forest. And then focusing in Scotland, uh, in, in the UK, um, work, and when we went to visit, we were visiting the University of Highlands and Islands, uh, where Sarah and Philomena graciously hosted us. So I've got two pictures uh, from two different forestry sites. Uh, the one on the left is from a site near Nelson, British Columbia. And the one on the right is uh, just outside of Inverness in Scotland. Uh, as far as clear cut sites go, they look fairly similar. Um, the one on the left, just because it is in the Canadian context is substantially larger and, um, and I would say messy, messier and a little bit more wasteful, uh, which is something that I learned over the course of the work that we were doing was how different the, the context, um, how, how the different context really influenced forestry practices. And I think uh, overall, um, you know, not to, not to disparage my own forestry sector because they do an amazing job, but I think Canadians on the whole can be and tend to be a little bit more wasteful when it comes to, to forestry than, than in Scotland, just because we, we have a lot of trees. Um, so moving on, um, when, when it came specifically to the role of technology and in innovation, um, I was asking folks questions like, could they describe the role of technology and innovation in the forestry sector? Um, what major changes to forestry and technology had they seen or they experienced? Uh, how did they see the sector changing as a result of those new technologies and innovations? And what did they expect to see in the next 10 years? And so I talked to 18 people in British Columbia and about 12 people in uh, Scotland. And the folks that I spoke with ran the gamut from professional foresters to educators, so people who worked in the forestry schools, um, mill operators, some local government folks, uh, community forests, just to, to get a really wide ranging perspective and also folks uh, within conservation as well, I should mention. 
And so what I found, and I'm going to spend uh, a, a great deal of time on this slide, and, and forgive me if I, well, I guess you won't know if, I, if I'll forget something, but because uh, I can't see my notes. <laughs> So what we found when we asked these, the questions around technology and innovation is that really the applications run across the board, and please forgive the pun, but everything from basically from seed to final end product and training and education and beyond. And so, for example, when it came to planning and management, within Canada in particular, we saw a great deal of um, emphasis on technology use in planning and management because we have large areas. So with um, techniques like GIS or GPS, the use of drones or UAVs, these techniques allow us to cover, um, gr cover and plan and manage large tracts of, of ground where formerly we would have used uh, a great deal of, of human power to, um, to actually be able to plan and manage that area. Um, Silviculture, so that's you know the the planting and cultivation and um, management uh, stand management. There was a less discussion of technology and innovation there, but it was it was still there. Um, I visited a tree farm in just outside of Inverness, um, where I was lucky enough to see some of the technology that they were implemented and and, and innovation as well. And what was really interesting is that you know on one hand there was there were technological innovations so machinery that were allowing them to become more efficient in their operations but there was also more just uh, innovative techniques and in some cases innovative techniques that were returning to older ways of doing things so instead of um, pesticides and things like that they were waxing the seedlings so you, um, I, I assume it wasn't candle wax but you know it was it was a low tech but high innovative solution to a problem that they were having within harvesting which is is the third line there Again, that was uh, probably next to planning and management, the second largest category of, of where I heard that technology and innovation was applied. And this is revolutionar revolutionized harvesting um, because when it used to be a large number of people doing unsafe jobs in the bush, it's now a smaller number of people working very advanced machinery, uh, increased output, uh, increased value per, per area. So it's not just being able to get through more trees, but be able to get more value out of uh, a particular sec uh, section of trees and increased safety for those workers, uh, increases in, you know, like the personal protective equipment that they have uh, through technology and, and through innovative processes but also um, in things like communication. So where you used to have folks working alone in the bush, they now have things like spot devices where you just hit the button or you have to hit the button every hour to say that you're okay. And if not, they send somebody to check on you. And those types of things never used to, to exist. And so as a result of technology and innovation, we really improved the safety and efficiency of harvesting. Same thing in the processing sector. I was lucky enough to visit a couple of our mills here locally in the Kootenays and the technology that they have is is crazy. It's far beyond anything that I think I would have expected. You've got um, the use of scanners and modelers that are able to, to do a detailed three-dimensional scan of a tree and say, okay, here's where the flaws are, here's where the weaknesses are. If we cut it like this, we're going to maximize the amount of timber that we can get out of it while minimizing the amount of waste. And so again, increased value for, for the trees that they're cutting down. When it came to end use, this is actually, um, I didn't hear as much from the Canadian folks that I interviewed uh, as I did from the folks in Scotland when it came to end use. But the folks that I talked to in Scotland had a great deal to say about um, not only potential new markets, but potential new um, uses for timber and different types of timber. So cross lamb and glue lamb, like the ability to, to take timber and make it stronger so that you can use it in things like um, midterm high rises, which never used to be possible before. And so going beyond what we traditionally think that we can use timber for because of advances in technology and uh, innovation. Then the last piece on there was when it came to training and education, as I'm sure everyone can imagine, with all of these advances, when you're heading out uh, as a forester or logger, 
into the bush with an iPad instead of a bunch of maps, or you're sitting in the cab of a, a machine that costs three or four hundred thousand dollars, there's and you're basically working a, a computer uh, very similar to almost um, like a video game with a joystick and that type of thing. So it's it's very different from what it used to be. I know when I was younger and I grew up in a, in a forest town, um, a, lot of, a lot of folks would just leave high school and go straight into the forestry sector. And that's not necessarily the case anymore. And that was something that folks talked about quite a bit was just how the skills and uh, training needed have changed. Um, beyond those, um, call it the, the seed to, to board discussions that I had about how technology and innovation worked into each element uh, along the supply chain. There were some overarching themes that came out of it. Uh, and the first one um, I'll talk about with the, the Red Cross in the middle there, and I did mention it earlier, was around safety, safety and efficiency. Um, so when it comes to technology and innovation, the main driver that I that came across very strongly was was not necessarily just increasing production and profit, but was more geared towards making safer workspaces. And that seemed to be a, a critical driver um, of, of technology and innovation. The other ones that I was in, in terms of key themes that I saw were, again, that um, workforce piece and the changes within the workforce, not only in terms of the skills uh, and education that are needed and the challenges that, that, that technology and innovation present for education because it's constantly changing and we all know how slow curriculum is to evolve and so trying to keep up when it comes to education with all these new developments was very challenging but then we also see contextual changes that impact the workforce as well both um, southeastern British Columbia and Scotland have an aging demographic. What we're looking at is, is a, honestly a great deal of retirement within the forestry sector, but everyone was quick to follow up by saying there's a recruitment issue. All of the things that I just talked about, all the high tech advances, all of the, the skills that you really need to be in this sector, people don't um, or the impression of the people that I talked to was that the average general public or the average high school student looking to pick a career didn't think about forestry as a high tech sector. They were more interested in, in going to something more more modern, where particularly in Canada, forestry is, is seen similar to mining in being dirty, dangerous and dying, um, which is not in fact the case. And so a lot of people that I spoke with noted a need to change our uh, approaches to recruitment to show this technology and innovation side. Um, there's also major changes uh, that drive the use of technology and innovation just in, in terms of context and policy. So, you know, we have a more globally competitive market. Um, people do need to, to cut costs. And that was a fear around technology and innovation is that when it comes to things like planning and management, technology should be a tool. It shouldn't be a way to replace people on the ground. And in some cases, it, it was felt that it was. Um, so I, I did cover some of these implications in the, in the last slide when I was just chatting. But the implications for, for technology and innovation on the workforce, we're changing the skills that we need and, and the experience and also the experience that employers prefer where they used to uh, do a great deal of employee training, there's more of a preference now for employees to come in pre-trained with a great deal of experience. And that's in part because of the, the value of the investment in the technology. You, you're more apt to want to have somebody who actually knows how to work that machinery because mistakes can be so costly. Um, again, the, the implications on education and training the picture there is uh, of one of the Selkirk College students doing a, a course on how to, how to run drones, which is not something that I did when I was doing field courses at Lakehead University. We were still walking through the bush with chains. Um, and then again, those changes in context have big implications for the workforce. Individually, it's, it's um, building those opportunities, but we also, we see at an individual, local and global scale, not only those changes in things like international trade that impact the need to be more competitive, but we're seeing um, 
precarious workforce is on the upswing. It's not a, a subject that um, I want to go too in depth on, but a lot of the people that I talked to, when I asked them how many employees they had, for example, they would give me their number of full-time employees and then almost double or triple the amount of contractors that they had hired. So you're looking at a, a very different employment uh, environment than it used to be a number of years ago where you just get a job and work there until you retired. It's now large amounts of contract work, which again favors folks that have higher levels of experience. So while in a lot of cases they, the forestry sector are looking for people and they're having a hard time finding people, they're also there are some barriers to taking on entry level workers as well. Um, so just quickly, because I know I've, I've gone slightly over time, um, in terms of next steps, when it comes to um, regional workforce development in rural British Columbia, Selkirk College under Terry McDonald is continuing to do a, a project that's looking at workforce development, it includes forestry, but other major rural sectors as well. And so you can visit their website for updates on that. Um, I think the next step is applying technology and innovation to, to big questions. Right now, we can see from the interviews that I've done that while technology and innovation is important and there's been a lot of benefits, it isn't necessarily the driver of forestry. It's not, it's not that linchpin subject that everyone's talking about. When I look through the interviews, everyone was talking about uncertainty around things like climate change and global markets. They're talking about how to be a resilient industry heading forward into the future. And so technology plays a role in that, but it's a question of expanding it, uh, the role that it has played to take that more bigger picture perspective. And then lastly, finding the right people, uh, particularly through changing uh, recruitment, changes in education and getting them to the right places, which is also another, uh, another challenge just in terms of where the jobs are not necessarily where the people with those skills are. Uh, and that's a, a particular challenge for rural places. Uh, so my contact information is there and I'm currently working at University of Saskatchewan. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions on this, uh, but if you're interested in the overarching project and the continuation of it, you can also contact Terry McDonald at Selkirk College. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sarah. So for those of you watching, it is now the question and answer period. So while we wait, I do have, I'll, I'll start off with a question. I do have a question for Sarah Breen. I was just wondering, um, made me think when you're talking about the technology and innovation, how like education kind of has um, trouble keeping up. Did you come across like policy implications having trouble keeping up or are there any like challenges with addressing policy and all of these tech changes, whether it has to do with safety or anything like that? Absolutely. Um, and so I'm glad you asked that because it was something that I didn't mention uh, in my presentation. But so um, I'll use the example of slash piles uh, or brush piles or brash piles. I think they might call them in Scotland, but it's a huge challenge here where when you do a, a cut block, your leftover pile of stuff, essentially, all the branches, all the stumps, everything that they leave behind because it's not, um, it's not merchantable timber, they're not gonna move it, move it on to where it's going. Now, the policy, there's a lot of opportunity of what you can do with that leftover stuff, um, you know, whether it's putting it into um, you know, bioenergy, whether that's heat or electricity, but it can also go into creating products, mixing it with different epoxies and, and turning it into stuff. Like there's a great deal of potential that goes into the use of that residual fiber. But in British Columbia, there's also some policy disincentives and barriers to actually doing so. Um, you have to, uh, this is a, a gonna be a, a bit of an oversimplification, but just for, for the sake of everyone, you have to, to pay to, to move um, everything off the site. And so if what you're paying doesn't equal what you're getting out of it, it it's a disincentive. Um, one of the more common uses for things like, uh, like that leftover waste would be to bring it to a pulp and paper mill. And in some cases they may pay you less than what you're paying to get it off site and get it to them, particularly when you factor in things like distances and uh, like moving it between one place to another. And so there's recognition that um, the policy needs to be 
improved or there could be uh, incentives in order to say like, okay, we don't want, you don't want people just bringing a clear cut site down to absolutely nothing because you need woody debris for um, like to put nutrients back into the soil. You need it for habitat for creatures, that type of thing. But, you know, there could be incentives saying if you can do this in an environmentally respectful um, manner that you can, uh, and, and prove what the what you're going to be using it for later on. Um, like there's opportunities there for them to create incentives through policy that that haven't currently been dealt with. But that's something that they're aware of. Cool. Thanks. Um, so our next question is from Shirley Thompson. She asks, could you speak to the issues of local forestry for use in housing on reserves to deal with the housing crisis, particularly for First Nations traditional territory? I'm address to a specific person, so either of you can jump in. Um, so this isn't, it, that's not a, um, an area that came up specifically in the interviews that I did. Um, and it's not, it's not something that I'm going to pretend to be an expert about. I know uh, from a policy perspective that that's another area that there would be potential barriers that would have to be changed in order to, to create supportive policy. Um, the community forest, forestry legislation in British Columbia is, is great and there have been some, there are some amazing examples of community uh, forests that, you know, cut down their own timber and turn it into saw logs and sell it off but I don't know of any examples, or I can't think of any examples, I should say, and that's not to say that they don't exist, of community forest, uh, community forestry being used to deal with, with local housing crises. I do know um, that if we look at, call them the, the smaller, medium-sized forestry enterprises, and I see this, this isn't necessarily something that came out of my um, research, but this is something that I see personally in the Kootenays. So these small, medium-sized enterprises are, are really part of the fabric of the community. And, and why I think that might be relevant here is because I see, I see the input that they put into a community, say with, um, you know, like our visitor center, even in downtown Nelson, all the boards that were provided for the patio outside were provided from one of our local mills. And so I think that there's opportunity, I guess if, if I were to, to offer any sort of answer, and I'm sure that this isn't what you were looking for, but um, I think that those opportunities for building the relationships and partnerships would be the avenue that I would want to explore for dealing with a housing crisis. Because if you can have that relationship with a local mill enough to, you know, to have them donate wood for small, um, for small projects locally, then maybe you can develop a small housing co-op or something like that where, where you're getting wood for whether it's a discount price or, or you're um, exchanging labor for the wood in the end, something like that. Those would be avenues that I would see as being potential ones. Great. Thank you. Um, we do have a second question, which is pretty similar to the first, but I'll read it out just in case any of it might prompt another idea. Um, it's from Laurel Gardner, and she wants just to know if either of you have any awareness of the Indigenous forest communities that are using local wood for housing or biomass heating. I don't know if heating might come to thing. If not. Sarah, did you hear a lot about biomass and biofuels in any of your interviews? <clears throat> Biomass and biofuels, yeah, well, they are trying to get new markets, actually, and they are really um, they are trying to pick that aspect up just uh, because to, to equal our timber price fluctuations and cheap imports and things like that. So it does play a role, definitely. Uh, yeah, it was, um, it's an interesting question, particularly when it, be, when it comes to, to heat and electricity and the role that, that context really plays there. So for... For a grid connected community, so more apt to be maybe a settler community in British Columbia, you're not gonna, the, the return on investment for uh, energy generation isn't really there because of the volume of hydropower that we have. Whereas when I was doing work in Newfoundland, 
a number of the um, forest companies, um, I actually have a friend who owns a, like a furniture making business and they used all the residual sawdust to create pellets that everyone used in their local wood stoves or they were generating electricity off of that because the return on investment was there. I haven't heard of any, uh, or in, in the research that I did, I, I didn't come across any specific examples of First Nations communities, but I can see uh, particularly for remote communities where the, the return on investment case would be because so many of those communities are using fly and fuel sources. So they're very expensive having, um, you know, biofuel based, whether that's wood or others, uh, forms of heating or electricity makes a great deal of sense and should be, in my opinion, supported through policy. Um, can I come in? Um, I think it's interesting, the whole issue about biomass in Scotland, because the Scottish government has had a policy of providing households with uh, subsidies to establish biomass heating at an individual household level. And, but um, the, uh, the, I think that in the Highlands as a whole, there's only one company that possibly produces biomass fuel. So whilst the Scottish government has been encouraging households to install these things by subsidizing the price of these, the households have been dependent on imported, <laughs> sounds absolutely weird to me, but imported biomass. And we had a situation this winter where there were a whole lot of households in the Highlands who could not get biomass because we had two centimeters of snow and the deliveries couldn't be delivered here. So, you know, it is a bit of a, so, um, and I'm sure there must be some discussions taking place somewhere <laughs> to produce locally, local biomass. But, you know, <laughs> this is one of the disconnected policies that we have, you know, we have, I had a colleague and actually within the research unit who was struggling to find biomass to, to, um, so that he could heat his house in a period when they needed some warmth in the house. So, <laughs> yeah, well, we have some way to go. Okay, great. Um, so our next question is from Ray Bowman, and it's a question for everyone. Regarding the apparent lack of individuals being trained slash educated for the new jobs in forestry, uh, how much of this gap should be filled by forestry firms who train and educate their own employees as opposed to looking to colleges, universities to guess what job skills will be demand in demand in four years? Hi, Ray. Um, awesome question. It, and it's a really, it, uh, I'll try and keep this short so that Sarah can respond because I'm sure she'll have a lot to add to this, but when it comes to say registered professional foresters or registered forestry technicians, everyone that I spoke to uh, on the education side and, and on the employer side said that's, that's not necessarily where, where the, the disconnect is. I mean, there's lots of debates as to the breadth and depth of knowledge that those folks need to have, but for the most part, professional foresters and forestry technicians are hired, they're hired quickly, and um, you know, their subsequent training and professional credits continue from there. Where a lot of the job gaps that I saw or heard about were around the, the other jobs, um, you know, the, the folks working in the plant, labor on the ground, uh, truck drivers, haulers, these types of things that are it, in a weird transition where they weren't typically educated positions, but um, are now getting to the point where they, they need to be because of the level of technology. There isn't necessarily always an appropriate course or class. And in some cases there can't be an appropriate course or class for, for those folks. So that's, that's one element of it. And there certainly is, and I did hear a number of comments about the private sector in an effort to save money is now expecting public education to, to do their training for them, um, which you know, was, was expressed by some and not by others. Um, and then the, I guess the other training, in terms of training gaps, what I heard more 
than almost anything else was we can train hard skills, but we need people coming in, particularly in a planning and management uh, area that have communication, public speaking, uh, conflict management, these, this completely different skill set that isn't a skill that you'd think when you talk about forestry and the companies or even the uh, public sector employers aren't necessarily prepared to, to train folks in that because they don't know, uh, like they don't know themselves how, how to train that. That's what I heard. Yeah, I would also say uh, that especially on the vocational level, there are already initiatives in place in Scotland, at least in terms of apprenticeship. So that is happening. But that is uh, not looking into kind of graduate managerial positions. Um, what I've heard from the private sector in particular is that they're not willing to um, commit that kind of investment. Although that once people come out of uh, university, they offer graduate schemes every once in a while to actually have that kind of socialization and um, yeah, molding process actually to company values and, and whatever kind of working relationships or whatever kind of management they envisage to be good. So um, there are schemes related to that, but I think actually it's quite good as Sarah said already that there's an outer world that we need to have a look at and for us, the whole kind of rules are expanding. So is it actually a good thing, a desirable thing to put that kind of monopoly into private hands? I don't know, I wonder, I wouldn't. <laughs> I would say that is a hot, a hot debate <laughs> as well. So. There certainly is a wider debate in the context of the UK and well, Scotland as to who should pay for industry related training. And I have this feeling at the back of my head, but I couldn't swear to it that there might be some um, employers, uh, some taxation. There's a levy, There's a levy mm -hmm. that the government, um, uh, and this is the UK uh, Conservative government at the moment that's just, I think, in the last few months, as far as I know. Um, um, uh, you know, ha has had a levy applied to the private sector to cover training. So this is, you know, it's it's sort of an ongoing issue. The other aspect, the issue around what people called so-called soft skills, you know, this idea that um, I think it's not peculiar to the forestry industry. I mean, that certainly has does come up in um, uh, employer surveys, at least in the United Kingdom generally, all the time, that they have people with the technical skills, but what they don't have are people with the soft skills. And, you know, there seems to be um, an assumption that you're born with it. Or, you know, I don't really know. You know, why, what is stopping people from, is it so difficult to train people, you know, um, to provide training to people, to mentor people into working in a, cross-sectoral way across disciplines and so on you know but that's been an ongoing debate for quite a while in the UK and you know there isn't you know um, and they do have mentoring schemes and so on but you know it's um, I don't really know what the block is there particularly you know but I think oh sorry Phil I mean I was gonna say I think part of the block is is uh, or at least here is the context is um, the grounds constantly changing under everyone's feet. Um, like we have, we used to have duty to consult uh, that would come from the public sector to, uh, to communities and stakeholder groups. Now the emphasis is on the, the private companies to do that um, with changing regulations around First Nations. Um, like the, the soft skills portion and not, not just the skills themselves, but how they're implemented and, um, and how they work with the policy and regulation is, is a really, it's an ever changing minefield that um, no one really, not that no one knows how to deal with it, but it, I think it's, it's just presents additional challenges for, for employers, for educators, for training folks, just because it's, it's such an unknown. Yeah. No, I agree with you. It's a, it's a shifting ground, isn't it? It's a constant. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. So we've hit the hour mark. We have one last question, so we'll go through this. Um, in Manitoba, there are very few or no opportunities for training of forestry technicians and hands-on forestry. Is this declining in other provinces as well? 
So Shirley, if you want to send me an email, and we can talk more about this later, and I can put you in contact with some some more people as well. But um, I'm actually I'm super surprised by your question because the in if anything in other provinces it's growing. Um, you know, our um, almost every school across BC, whether it's a college or a university, has a, a forestry department. The university ones are, are expanding uh, to the point where you can do specializations in a number of different things. At the college level, they're working to expand their, their co-op, um, really that hands-on experience piece. So you're getting the technical diploma and doing work experience throughout, um, throughout that time. And it certainly is expanding here uh, from colleagues that I have in Ontario, I believe that it, it's at least remained static since I, I was in school there. So I'm, I'm surprised um, by decreasing opportunities in, in Manitoba. We can, but we can certainly talk more about that because I have some, some contacts that might be useful for you on that uh, if you want to send me an email or give me a call, something like that. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Um, so that concludes our webinar. I would like to thank our presenters, Philomena, Sarah, and Sarah, for their fantastic presentations as well as the audience for the great questions.